Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, fourth episode of our climate seminar series dedicated to climate change adaptation and mitigation. As you may know, my name is Charmilino, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's session. We're going to have two great talks, as you can see on my slide I'm sharing. First, Agnes Cascohon is going to introduce her talk, Aviation Impacts on Climate. We're going to have a short discussion all together. Then uh, Edouard Grispeard is going to go on with his talk, COVID Contrails in Climate Change. Once more, we're going to have a short Q&A, and the session is going to end around a quarter past one. As you can see, the two talks are going to be in English, but for French speakers, don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat in French or to ask your questions in French, and I'm going to be happy to translate them. Uh, as I mentioned, you can mention you can write your um, your questions directly in the chat, or when the Q and A um, happens, you can simply open your microphone, open your camera, discuss with us. Don't hesitate. So our first guest speaker today, Agnes Cascohon, I'm going to introduce her briefly. She's a research associate at Manchester Metropolitan University. Her research interests primarily concentrate on investigations of global and regional effects of nitrogen oxides emissions from aviation on climate. She also works on existing trade-offs between different aviation effects. She's a member of the Impact and Science Group at the International Civil Aviation Organization. Agnieszka, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and the floor is yours. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, having me here <laughs> at the uh, uh, present seminar. I'm just sharing my screen. So I will, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will introduce uh, you to various aspects of uh, um, aviation uh, impacts on climate. So um, aviation contributes to warming and uh, its contribution is beyond carbon only as uh, it can be observed uh, that uh, uh, regardless of the scenario, the warming footprint of aviation is at least twice as large as the carbon footprint in uh, the coming decade, clearly highlighting that the non-CO2 effects are uh, non-negligible uh, to assess the contribution of aviation on, uh, uh, or contribution of aviation to global warming. So uh, aircraft engines produce emissions that are similar to other emissions resulting from the fossil fuel combustion. However, um, aircraft uh, emissions are unusual in that its significant proportion is uh, emitted at altitude. Uh, this emissions affect on the composition, changes the cloudiness, uh, which in turn uh, affect the radiative balance of, uh, of the atmosphere, then the climate system then responds to that radiative forcing leading to, for example, the surface temperature change. So uh, aviation can also have effects on local air quality uh, impacting human health. Aviation is calculating, uh, is calculated to represent about 3.5% of the total radiative impact on climate to date. Uh, it, and affects climate for both its CO2 and uh, non-CO2 emissions. Uh, so let's start with some direct uh, effects. Uh, one of them is CO2. Um, the contribution of aviation to global CO2 is around 2.4%. Um, uh, but uh, aviation CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. So it provides, in the, in the end, it provides uh, the, the vast part of the long-term warming from, from aviation. The other uh, direct um, uh, emissions, direct uh, effects, uh, belong to water vapor uh, and aerosols. Um, water vapor um, is currently assessed to be small, uh, and the forcing is positive. Its importance increases with altitude, but let's concentrate on troposphere, upper troposphere only. Uh, the other emissions, non CO two emissions, are the sulfur dioxide that arises from the sulfur in the fuel, which oxidizes, oxidized, uh, which is oxidized to form uh, sulfate particles, and that results in negative radiative forcing. Emissions of soot particles um, that results in uh, a positive radiative forcing, 
uh, sulfate and soot then can uh, interact with clouds. Um, all those impacts are, uh, are kind of uncertain and both in terms of sign and uh, magnitude. Going further, uh, we have um, so from this initial emissions of water vapor and uh, condensing on co-emitted soot particles uh, in cold ice supersaturated region, regions of uh, the atmosphere contrail cirrus. Um, clouds are formed. Uh, contrails can persist, spread, and grow into a contrail cirrus uh, cloud coverage. Um, the relative effects vary strongly with uh, location, altitude, and time of emission. It varies from positive to negative. Um, but I will leave this uh, all aspects for, for, for the next talk. I would just mention that um, uh, currently, the, the, the formation of country cirrus uh, uh, is currently understood to be the largest non-CO2 uh, effect from aviation. Uh, together uh, with uh, the effect on chemistry from uh, emissions of uh, NOx. And here I will concentrate uh, slightly more on, on NOx. Um, so NOx, uh, nitrogen oxide acts as an indirect cases. Um, the emission of NOx from aircraft triggers a series of chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Um, that results in the formation of ozone, uh, a greenhouse gas, uh, and the destruction of methane, another greenhouse gas. Uh, in addition, methane change has further implications in the atmosphere, pyrite composition, and uh, methane as a precursor of uh, ozone, so uh, is a precursor of ozone, so a decrease in methane due to aviation NOx emissions leads to a decrease in background ozone. Additionally, less methane enters the stratosphere where it's decomposed into carbon dioxide and water vapor. So eventually this reduces the stratospheric water vapor concentrations. Um, and since water vapor is a greenhouse gas, it reduces the climate warming as well. Further, there NOx emissions are also involved in the some aerosol reactions. So uh, with nitrates, so producing nitrates and sulfates, and those effects are associated with um, order uh, small cooling. Uh, all together, if uh, you you gather all the aspects of contributors, so based on current understanding, there is net not warming um, from aviation. Uh, NEDNOX effects are highly dependent on the state of the atmosphere into which NOx is emitted. Uh, these differences are <clears> that are that are are uh, I led by latitudinal differences in solar flux, the background NOx levels, uh, the regional emissions of uh, the regional emissions, the, the chemistry uh, of hydrocarbons, etc. So equal NOx emissions in different regions can lead to quite different globally average net NOx changes depending on their temporal, geographical, vertical uh, location, and vice versa, different size of uh, NOx emission under the same conditions uh, will lead to different net NOx changes. So it is a highly non-linear system. Mm. Looking, for example, at the vertical location, any change in the altitude of emissions will uh, will affect the net NOx related forcing, trying higher um, via more uh, efficient ozone production increases that NOx effect. Uh, the opposite happens if you fly uh, lower, and then the methane uh, destruction is uh, more pronounced, and that reduces the total net NOx uh, uh, effect. Um, Regarding the location, the, the intensity of uh, sunlight drives the photochemistry, uh, the high temperatures affect the efficiency of uh, methane oxidation. So it all uh, means that uh, regarding the geographical location, emissions from low latitude have a larger radiative forcing than equal emissions uh, from mid latitude and generally more developed nations which can be a complicated factor for uh, policymakers. Uh, another aspect um, is um, 
background conditions. So the contribution of uh, aircraft NOx to the formation of tropospheric ozone is only uh, one range, uh, one uh, of a range of anthrop anthropogenic sources and other uh, emissions of carbon monoxide, methane, other emissions of NOx, uh, they all play a role in ozone formation. So uh, the effect of an emission of aircraft NOx depends on other sources too. Uh, here, um, the net NOx aircraft forcing term was varied for the same aircraft emissions depending on the background conditions, on the background emissions. Um, and it was uh, observed that the, the predicted cleaner background here is the, the scenario RCP 2.6, that is the environmentally friendly uh, scenario, climate friendly scenario. So under the predicted cleaner background uh, in the future, um, the, it can mitigate the greater net NOx release forcing arising from the, the, the air traffic growth. And so, uh, I guess it's worth highlighting that the cutting ground level emissions and pollution serve not only air quality uh, improvements, but one also be uh, impact uh, of aviation NOx. Um, so let's uh, come back to where we were at the beginning. So aviation uh, affects climate with both its CO2 and non CO2 emissions. Both are uh, very different in their nature, especially in terms of uh, their persistence in the atmosphere. Uh, CO2, once up there, once it's emitted, it basically stays there forever, in contrast to no CO2, which uh, effects uh, last as long as its uh, source exists. Um, so, in order to let you imagine how um, what CO2 and no CO2 means for climate. And to highlight that uh, uh, looking at the CO2 only is not enough, I, I drew a few hypothetical uh, scenarios. Let's start with the uh, scenarios, uh, scenario pieces. So the net NOx, so the net, not, uh, net non CO2 effects of aviation currently represents approximately two, two thirds of the total relative forcing of global aviation. Uh, this fraction is not fixed, but it is uh, dependent on the growth rate of So if global aviation activity uh, continue to increase, uh, the non-CO2 effects will continue to dominate the total rate of forcing. Um, let's have a zero emission scenario. So we are stop we stop flying from today. Uh, what will happen is uh, we would uh, observe uh, the, the CO2, um, uh, the CO2 generally stays there uh, because uh, it's not emitted, uh, but it also does not disappear. It does not go out, so it stays there. Um, the no CO2 will disappear uh, because of their short uh, time scale. Effect. So if we stop flying now, we would reverse some of that warming that happens today. If uh, we have a constant emission scenario, we would see that uh, the, 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 no, the CO2 will increase because uh, the accumulative nature of CO2, uh, but the non-CO2 uh, will equilibrate, but that still means uh, the, the total aviation impact will, will continue warming. Uh, uh, I mean, the warming continues to increase over time. Um, so having, uh, imagining the reduced emission scenario, uh, we would see again, CO2 will increase because even there is less CO2, but it's still there and it still build, it, it, it builds up. Uh, but the no CO2 uh, effects will start to decrease. And that means that the total aviation impact there is a chance for it to uh, to 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 get constant. Um, so here um, there might be a question. So how much do we need to reduce flying to achieve uh, no further warming? So to exercise those uh, few hypothetical scenarios, we played with some real numbers. Um, this figure illustrates uh, the warming impact of aviation resulting from uh different uh, scenarios 
uh, accounting for both CO2 and non-CO2 policing. In general, aviation uh, is uh, on track to cause a total of about uh, 0.1 degree of warming by 2050. And the reduction due to COVID uh, to date is small and is projected only to delay uh, aviation's contribution to warming. Interestingly, a zero growth scenario will still cause rising temperature because of that CO2 that keeps um, accumulate, that keeps setting up. Uh, what will help for the warming is the reduction of air traffic by uh, 2% each year. It's interesting to observe uh, that um, if emissions, if emissions CO2 emissions uh, decline, uh, the non-CO2 warming um, reduces significantly. So um, if CO2 emissions are reduced, the non-CO2 impacts are, are reduced too. Um, I think this is a kind of the, the, the small detail that is not widely appreciated, uh, uh, maybe yet. <laughs> Uh, and at the moment, uh, the non CO2 uh, uh, impacts dominate two thirds over one third of uh, CO2. However, um, the reason for that is the underlying growth of uh, uh, rate, the growth rate of aviation. If emissions level up or uh, uh, decline, uh, a different ratio results. So, to just summarize, uh, despite the increase in knowledge over the past two decades, um, we are in a position of uh, uh, of confidence to, to to recommend definite strategic uh, courses of action on aviation non CO two emissions uh, for climate protection. Uh, this is because uh, um, the effects of aviation uh, non CO two emissions on climate remain highly uncertain. Um, uh, both in yes, really the the variation of time space. Uh, um, amount of emitted uh, emission, it also uh, increased the uncertainty. Um, however, it's worth uh, rate or also existing trade-offs um, between non-CO2 and CO2. So you have to be careful um, to don't uh, cause additional damage to the climate by trying to improve uh, uh, one, one agent, one non-CO2 uh, effect, for example. So, uh, but it's worth uh, to reiterate, I guess, that we have a good and sufficient knowledge in regarding CO2. So any small change in the emission really matters uh, here. And we know it's, it, it, it can only go one way. So it will be only beneficial for climate. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Edward Grispeard. I will introduce him briefly. Edward Grispeard is a Royal Society and University Research Fellow in the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London, where he arrived in 2017 after working at the Universities of Leipzig and Oxford. His group's research focuses on the response of clouds to human activity, particularly the impact of atmospheric aerosols. Edward, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chanel. And, um... Yes, and thank you to Agnieszka for her uh, talk previously as well, which sets the scene for um, this talk, which is going to be mostly on contrails. Um, so, oh, I change. yeah, perfect. Um, so contrails, obviously, like all clouds, are white, um, which means that they reflect sunlight away from the Earth and so cool the atmosphere. So they have a cooling effect, um, but they're also very high. So if you look at this image now, and we can see the contrails as, as these kind of uh, linear lines and and some of them are kind of spread out to form uh, contrail cirrus. If we look at this now in infrared, uh, we can simply see that contrails in general, the contrail cirrus is typically relatively high, um, which means it's cold. And so it blocks infrared um, from uh, leaving the atmosphere. And so contrails have a warming effect as well. Now these cooling and warming effects um, kind of change throughout the day. Um, but on average, we expect the contrails have a stronger warming effect and so have a warming effect on the climate as a whole. Now, we've seen uh, plots very much like this already. Um, but the point being, of course, that contrails in general have a relatively large effective rate of forcing um, compared to uh, carbon dioxide emissions from aviation. Um, but it is also highly uncertain. 
Right? So while contrail cirrus likely represents the majority of the uh, rate deforcing from aviation, it also represents the majority of the uncertainty. Now, the attractive thing um, about contrails, as we heard in the uh, questions as well, is that there might be the possibility for an immediate reduction in the climate impact of aircraft. Contrails are basically proportional to the number of aircraft in the atmosphere right now. Um, and so if you can uh, reduce the number of aircraft or if you can reduce the contrail formation, because they have a short lifetime, that forcing disappears very easily. Whereas obviously the rate of forcing from CO2 can last for quite a long time. So obviously there's kind of, um, not only is there a large uncertainty here, but there's also an opportunity here for potentially reducing the climate impact of aviation um, in the near term. Now, the problem, of course, with contrails is that while those ones we saw in the previous image, many of them were kind of linear features that we could see fairly easily. If you watch them over time, they spread out and they become much harder to attribute to the aircraft that originally caused them. So this is from a, a paper in 2009. And if you look over the North Sea here, you can see uh, contrails in this image that's designed to pick out uh, contrail, uh, contrails. And you can see this kind of um, circular um, coil of contrails that's appeared over the North Sea, maybe from a, a military radar plane, for example. And as we track it over time, you can still see the kind of um, coil of contrails appearing there, but it gradually kind of blurs out. And if you looked at them in this last image here, it'd be very difficult to, to say, well, these, these clouds definitely came from aircraft. But as we wind back through time, you can see that at least some of it here was due to this aircraft. So obviously we have this issue of, of contrails forming and they then form clouds that look very much like natural cirrus. So how could we tell those apart? How would we know what the kind of effect of contrails on the climate is just from looking at them from satellite? So obviously here we need some kind of experiment, right? We need some way of saying, how does the amount of high cloud change if we change the amount of aircraft? Um, now, traditionally that would have been quite difficult to do. Um, but we did have uh, this kind of natural experiment from the shutdown in air traffic, the almost global shutdown in air traffic uh, due to COVID-19. Um, and so we see in this uh, kind of plot of jet fuel consumption from 2020, uh, you can see kind of March, April kind of time, Europe, the United States, most of the rest of the world, um, there was a big decrease in the amount of jet fuel consumed, the amount of aircraft flying, um, particularly over places like the North Atlantic. Now this gives us that ideal natural experiment where we can look at kind of what happens to high cloud if we change the number of aircraft in the atmosphere. And so a kind of observational way then of understanding what the kind of total climate effect of contrails might be beyond just the kind of linear ones you can see easily in the satellite image. Now that we saw a large change in the kind of flight miles due to COVID, um, but it wasn't the same everywhere. Right. We saw bigger decreases in the, the kind of flight miles, particularly over the North Atlantic, over Europe and the United States, whereas large other regions of the globe, there wasn't really a big change in aviation, um, partly because there are not many aircraft flying there to start with. And we can use this to kind of help us understand what's going on. So if we look at now um, the changing cloud between 2020 and the previous 10 years to average together, we can kind of split that up into different regions. We can say, how different was the high cloud in 2020 uh, compared to the previous 10 years in regions where we had uh, very little change in aircraft? And how different was it in regions where we had a big decrease in aircraft? Now, unfortunately, what we find is that in a lot of cases, 2020 just had less cloud than the previous 10 years on average, right? um, which is a little bit puzzling. But then if you think about it a little bit more, you're, you're comparing 2020, which is a specific year, to an average of the previous 10 years. Um, and 2020 had its own specific weather. Right? Is there any reason to believe necessarily that this difference of one year to an average would be caused by aircraft? It'd be difficult to say, right? And actually, we have good evidence that the weather in 2020 was very different to the previous 10 years. So in the UK um, in March, we had record breaking high pressure. Um, so it's actually very sunny for that first kind of lockdown uh, period. Um, and oops, um, it was actually one of the sunniest uh, Aprils on record. So that then gives us a bit of a question, right? That given that 2020 wasn't an average year, how would we be able to pick out uh, the impact of aviation from just the fact that 2020 was not an average year for high clouds? What would a 2020 with aircraft look like? So one thing we could do is we could take each day in 2020 
um, look at the weather pattern in that region and then match it to the closest match from the previous 10 years. Right? So we can then build up kind of a counterfactual 2020 out of data from the previous 10 years and look at the high clouds that exist in that kind of counterfactual 2020. Now, if we do that, we get these orange dots here. Right? So 2020 is the height, the amount of high cloud observed in 2020, the blue dots. The orange, tri or the kind of purple triangles rather, um, are the average cloud for the previous 10 years. And the yellow circle here then is the kind of counterfactual 2020 built out of the previous 10 years. And so what we see is kind of, you see really, relatively little difference now in high cloud um, between 2020 and the kind of counterfactual 2020, gradually increasing as you move to kind of regions that had a bigger change in aircraft. So we can plot that a little bit differently here. And we see that cases where you didn't have much of a change in aircraft, you didn't have much of a change in Cirrus. Cases where you had a large decrease in the amount of aircraft, you also had a relatively large decrease in the amount of high cloud. So we can then take this and use this to, to kind of estimate what the overall rate of forcing uh, from contrails might be. Um, and this comes at about 61 milliwatts per meter squared, which is on the kind of slightly smaller end of that diagram, but there are still some uncertainties around this um, that we have to kind of assume, for example, that the aircraft that remain in 2020 look like kind of average aircraft from the previous years, which is not necessarily the case. Um, however, it gives us a broad picture to say, well, these estimates that we have from, from climate, largely from climate models are um, plausible and consistent with the change in aircraft we observed during 2020. Now, this gives us kind of, we still got this kind of picture here that, that the impact of uh, contrails on aviation is important, right? And because of this, large uh, kind of numbers of countries and international organizations have built up plans for reducing the climate impact of aviation and with a particular focus on uh, the non-CO2 impacts, right? So there's a collection of front covers of different reports here. Um, but the idea is that these come from multiple different countries um, and different regions, right? Okay, two of these are from the UK, but in general, they're from uh, different countries and different kind of aspects of society as well. So the question then is, well, what changes do we need to make? How could we reduce the climate impact um, of contrails? And also importantly, how do we know we'd made the right choices. If we've done something, how do we monitor it and make sure it was the correct choice? So for that, we need to think a little bit about how contrails form. Um, and I'm sure you'll recognize this diagram here of a jet engine um, and the background air mixing together. Um, but this here is essentially the same way that the contrail would form, right? So the hot, wet air from this jet engine or this bison um, is emitted into the cooler, drier air of its surroundings. And as you mix those two parcels of air, you can reach saturation and form a cloud. Now this cloud here is composed primarily of liquid droplets, um, but that's initially how a contrail forms and it freezes very quickly afterwards. So what this then means is we've got two criteria for forming a contrail. It must be cold enough, right? You don't see your breath form a cloud when it's very warm. And so we say the temperature has to be lower than what's called the schmidt ackermann criterion, which is just the threshold temperature for forming contrails. And it must be humid enough. Right, you see those clouds formed while your breath typically evaporate again because the humidity is too low. Um, and so typically for a contrail to kind of persist and live a long time, the humidity has to be greater than 100%. Right? And these longest lived contrails that form in these humid regions have the largest climate impact. So those are the ones we'd like to focus on. So there are two then options for reducing the climate impact of contrails. Right. One is kind of a technology option that we could modify the engine or the aircraft. Um, and the second is kind of an operational option. We could kind of modify the background or get the aircraft to fly into regions where uh, contrails were less likely to form. Um, so we'll, to start with, we'll think about the, the technology one. And that kind of comes from this idea that jet engines emit particulates, right? So here's a, a picture of a rather old aircraft emitting quite a lot of soot. But this relates to how contrails form. Right. So if you remember, these contrails form from little initial droplets of liquid water. And these droplets of liquid water are forming on the exhaust aerosol particles. So within the first second or so, you form a lot of little droplets of, of water on these aerosol particles, um, which then immediately freeze. This also then gives us some idea about what the properties of that contrail might be. Right? So if we have more aerosol particles, we might get more droplets and so more crystals. And if we have more crystals, everything else being equal, those crystals might be smaller 
And so they will sediment through the atmosphere slower and give us a longer lifetime. So an aircraft with higher soot emissions or higher non-volatile particulate matter um, might be expected to produce contrails with a longer lifetime. Now we can do kind of studies of this by looking at uh, kind of um, with in situ studies with aircraft, right? So this here is an image out the front of the DLR Falcon. Um, and you can see it's flying in behind um, a passenger jet here to measure the um, aircraft exhaust. Um, and that's great for kind of really short term studies, right? Where you can see the aircraft and you can be sure that the things you're measuring have come from that particular aircraft. But this is difficult if you're thinking about the kind of longer lived contrails. Right? Finding that contrail several hours later with an aircraft is quite tricky. But those longer lived contrails have the largest climate impact. So really we'd like some way of being able to tie that together. Um, and one thing we can do here is to use satellites. Now contrails show up uh, quite clearly if you use certain wavelengths from satellites. So this here is a false color image. Obviously the earth is not red. Um, but you can see the contrails here uh, standing out in yellow, right? As these kind of straight lines um, over the southern UK here. Um, civil aircraft typically form straight lines. You can also see uh, the impact of military aircraft and, and the contrails they form as well. So we can see here in the kind of invasion of the Ukraine, you can see contrails from, from various aircraft flying close to Ukraine. But it shows us that we can use satellites here for spotting aircraft um, and spotting contrails in particular. Now, doing this by hand is quite slow, right? If you think about kind of the contrails that exist in this image, there'd be quite a lot and searching through that by hand will take forever. Luckily now we can do the kind of thing of applying some machine learning and get a computer to do it for us. And so we can train the computer to pick out contrails in uh, an, a satellite image like this um, and see that it does a pretty reasonable job of identifying uh, the contrails similar to the ones the human had identified, maybe even picking out kind of bits of things that the human missed out to start with. So it seems like you know, using a computer to do this is, is a good way forward. Um, if we do that, we find there are a lot of contrails and you can see these kind of patterns here off the east coast of the United States that definitely look like aircraft flight patterns, right? We've got these kind of straight lines here from aircraft heading from kind of the New York area further south. But there's also a lot of false positives kind of over land as well, right? We picked out rivers and things like that, which is non-ideal if we're searching for contrails. So what we can do is we can say, well, we know our contrail should have formed near an aircraft and we know it should move with the high level winds like we expect. Rivers typically don't move with the high level winds. Um, and we can do something like this, right? So we've got some flight data here. We can see this aircraft come through and we can see our neural net then starts to identify contrails that form behind it. And every, in this case, this is every 10 minutes or so, we can see that contrail exists, persists, and eventually dissipate again. And new contrail forming as this next aircraft comes through. So by tying these satellite observed contrails to specific aircraft, we can be reasonably sure that that actually is a contrail. And even better, we know the aircraft that produce that contrail as well. Now this cuts down a lot the number of the contract number of contrails we can look at, but we've now got a set of contrails we are very sure are actually contrails, and we've linked them to specific aircraft. So we can then start asking questions like how quickly does the satellite first observe contrails? And so if we look at the kind of time to initial visibility of a, a contrail in these satellite images, we see they start to appear about 10 minutes behind the passage of the aircraft. Right, so the, the satellite can't see the contrails immediately as they're formed, but it can see them within about 10, 15 minutes or so. And that's, that's fine, right? It, we've still got this ability to tie them to the aircraft. Um, and what we really care about is kind of how long they live rather than how quickly they form. So we can then start to ask questions about lifetime, right? So we've got all these contrail objects and we can now say, what's the probability of a contrail object living longer than an hour? And how does that relate to the probability of the, the properties of the aircraft? So first, what we can do is we can look at the relationship of contrail lifetime or the probability of that contrail object living longer than an hour and relate it to uh, the particular matter emitted by the aircraft. So these aircraft on the right typically emit more particles, more soot, and the ones on the left are typically cleaner. And what we see, unfortunately, is that actually, as we kind of move to cleaner condition, uh, move to cleaner conditions, we seem to find contrails living longer, 
But the dirtier aircraft form contrails that, that kind of dissipate faster. They're less likely to live longer than an hour. Um, the more efficient aircraft, typically the same ones that have cleaner burning engines, um, produce longer lived contrails as well. Um, this is exactly opposite from what we would expect given, um, so we've got this idea that, that more soot pollution leads to a shorter lifetime in contrails. And this is exactly the opposite of what we expect from modeling studies. Right, so this here is, um, this bottom axis here is the, the aerosol emissions from the aircraft or the NVPM emissions. And you can see that the model projects that as you kind of have more soot emissions, you should get longer lived contrails. So there's clearly something going on here um, that we're not quite understanding properly. Um, but even if we just look at kind of not the contrails that match the specific aircraft, but just how often aircraft tracks intersect with contrails, we see the same old same thing, right? So a very old aircraft type with an average age of 25 years produces, or it's it kind of you see contrails about one percent of the time behind that aircraft, um, whereas a much more modern, newer, advanced aircraft with an average age of five years produces contrails maybe 50 percent as much, and that live typically much longer as well. So we then got this kind of trade-off, right? This newer aircraft is more fuel efficient, so it's got less climate warming from CO2, but it produces contrails more frequently, which leads to more climate warming from non-CO2 effects. So there's this kind of trade-off there. Um, and it's apparently suggesting newer aircraft are worse for the climate. In practice, though, that's not the real story. It turns out we do actually understand uh, kind of how ice clouds work, at least partly. And the reason for this is that the newer aircraft fly in different parts of the atmosphere. So these plots are uh, relatively complicated, but um, they're important to understand what's going on. And so this here is showing for each of these aircraft types. So type A, which is the older aircraft, type B, which is the newer, more efficient aircraft, and then business aircraft as well. It's showing how cold their contrails are relative to the formation temp threshold temperature for contrails. Right, so this zero here is the temperature below which we expect contrails to start to form. And we see type A, the older aircraft, typically flies close to that formation threshold or forms contrails close to it. Whereas type B here, the more efficient aircraft, is forming contrails that are a lot colder than the formation threshold temperature. This is because it's flying higher. One of the things, one of the ways to become more efficient is to fly higher. Um, and so that's how type B flies. Now, producing colder contrails means those contrails have different properties. Right? Some of you, if you've kind of looked at clouds before, these kind of diagrams might be familiar. Um, if you haven't, I'm sorry, I will try and explain them. Um, but essentially what's happening here is these are three different environmental conditions. Right? And these lines here are showing kind of what happens when an aircraft is flying through the atmosphere. So the aircraft is way up on the top of the right here somewhere emitting relatively warm, relatively wet air because it's the output from the engine. And as it mix with, mixes with the environment, you travel along one of these lines. So either the dotted line or the dashed line. Um, and as you travel along this line, if you move into this white region here, then you can form a contrail, right? So this uh, kind of solid line here just touches that line and any environment that's warmer than that, you won't form a contrail. So this dashed line could be equivalent to, say, our Type A, our older aircraft, and this dotted line maybe our Type B. Now, as you move further into this white region, you achieve a higher saturation, and so more of your soot particles can become ice crystals. So broadly, what we expect is that as you move further to the right, which is the colder the contrail, the more ice crystals you have in the contrail. And if you remember back to this idea that you have more ice crystals, those ice crystals are on average smaller because you're sharing out the same amount of water through all these uh, crystals. And smaller ice crystal will fall slower through the atmosphere. And so might you, expect, you might expect contrails to live longer. So what we're seeing here is that the colder ice, the colder kind of um, flights of these aircraft producing contrails with more and smaller ice crystals, which means they last longer. Now, there's a little bit of evidence um, that you might be seeing improvements from NVPM, but for that, I think it will have to wait for another talk. So in summary then, contrails, as we've talked about in both these talks, are one of the largest components of the aviation climate impact. 
um, which makes them ideal for a rapid reduction in climate forcing because their lifetime is only a few days. But the size of this warming is really uncertain. The COVID-induced shutdown air traffic gave us this kind of experiment into to air traffic and its impact on uh, the climate and showed us that there was a significant impact of aviation in the amount of high level cloud and suggested that contrails uh, kind of total about 2% of the anthropogenic forcing of the climate. And we've also seen that if you look at specific aircraft, more efficient aircraft are forming longer lived contrails. But this is not due to the properties of the aircraft, but rather their flight patterns. That these more efficient aircraft are flying for the region we looked at in higher, colder conditions, which produces contrails with smaller ice crystals that live for longer. But it gives us this kind of trade off between the CO2 emissions of these aircraft, which in general would be smaller, um, and the contrail climate effects, which in general you might expect to be larger. So I'll uh, leave it there. If you want any extra information on this, the COVID work was in um, the Class et al. Uh, paper from 2021, um, and the um, study tied to aircraft type um, is currently under review, but hopefully will be accepted soon. Thank you.